all, this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. My internet today is down, so I am using my personal hotspot. I hope that the signal is fine. If the signal dropped, I would then just leave it instead of trying to work with it, and we would then meet again tomorrow. So with this, the discussion that we want to do today is the muscle pain. And the muscle pain has some characteristics that are different from the cutaneous pain or the pain from the skin. Skin pain is very highly localizable. You can tell where the pain is. And muscle pain is usually less localizable, more dull, more widespread. And then it tends to become chronic as well if the nociceptor is or the receptors are stimulated again and again. And if the central nervous system, that is the brain and the spinal cord that are participating in the pain signals, if they uh, become facilitated and start developing structural changes. This is also why uh, patients with muscle pains, chronic muscle pains, they are a little difficult to treat because the time is taken by the central nervous system to readapt and regress from the facilitation that it has done. However, it is possible to treat it. It just takes more time as compared to treating a pain, let's say, on the skin. So today what we are going to do is look at the, the receptors for the muscle pain, the kind of triggers that cause the muscle pain, and then next time we'll talk about how muscle pain becomes chronic, and then we will talk about a very important uh, hypothesis by a few researchers about why do muscle cramps occur and what is the MECFS and what could be behind uh, the mechanism of MECFS. Generally, uh, what they said was it is possible that the acidosis in the muscle, the collection of hydrogen ions or protons in the muscle would eventually cause the sodium load to occur within the muscle cell, which would then cause calcium load to develop within the muscle cell and the calcium causes the damage. So they believe that if proton load and sodium load can be reduced, then it is possible to improve the muscle pain in MECFS like situations. I believe that nowadays with long COVID and some vaccine injuries, it may be also the same mechanism that is applicable here too. So we would actually go in a series of talks. We'll talk about today the foundations of muscle pain. Next time we'll talk about how muscle pains become chronic. And then we'll talk about how the idiopathic muscle pains, the muscle pains for, for which we don't know really what is going on, what may be the possible mechanism and how to then manage them. Then we'll switch to neuropathic pain or neuropathies and then have a similar series with them as well. So with this, my request to you is that please like, subscribe, and share so that uh, more people can hear it. Uh, from 60 to 80% of Americans at some point will feel pain that might tend towards chronicity. 7% of women at the age of 70 to 80 have chronic pain as well. So let's start. So we are going to start with the references. This is drbean.com. And in the um, description of this video, there is a link which is <laughs> which contains a very inexpensive uh, rate for the access to drbean.com lectures that are present here. This is the uh, article that I'm going to be looking at today with you, Muscle Pain, Mechanisms, and Clinical Significance. These links are in the description as well. There are some more links there, which I'm not going to go in detail. This article and, and the study is more on the musculoskeletal system, including bone and joint as well. I would treat them separately. And this is that study that I said will be very useful to actually look at. This is pathophysiology of skeletal muscle disturbances in myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, or MECFS. And then finally, something about piezoelectric, uh, sorry, piezoreceptors as well. So with this, let's go to my 
diagrams and start from here. So this diagram is from the previous pain discussion. So if you see here, this was nerve. I'm going to change that in the next diagram from nerve to muscle. But important thing to remind you is that the pain fibers, there are two main kind of pain fibers. Number one is the C fibers, which are thin, unmyelinated fibers. And usually they conduct the signal at lesser than two meter per second velocity. And then there are a delta fibers, which are slightly more in diameter and they are myelinated as well. So they are a little more faster compared to C fibers and they conduct at two to 10 meter per second. Some literature says two to 30 meter per second. So faster than the C fibers and then definitely slower than the A beta fibers, which are for touch pressure type sensations. We had discussed this last time that there are receptors at the end of the pain nerves, which are called the free nerve endings. And these receptor areas are the ones that would start the transduction, the process of creating pain from some other kind of energy, for example, deep touch, deep pressure, acidosis in the system, inflammatory mediators, etc. So just for a reminder that the mediators that can cause pain, inflammatory mediators, or others, acetylcholine, ATP, hydrogen, serotonin, bradykinin, histamine, prostanoids. So we have had that discussion. Now I'm going to go to the muscle-specific components. So here, if you see, muscles, of course, have free nerve endings as well that innervate them. And of course, these free nerve endings will be called nociceptors or the receptors for noxious stimuli or painful or unpleasant stimuli. The nociceptors in the muscle will respond to strong mechanical signals, for example, trauma or overload on the muscle. The muscle overload can be both in flexion or in extension of the muscle. And mechanical trauma is mechanical trauma. Then inflammatory mediators. So imagine that muscle itself doesn't have any issues, but in the body, there are inflammatory mediators. Those mediators, for example, bradykinin, serotonin, prostaglandins, E2, they are going to cause or going to facilitate the pain. And I'm going to explain today that what is their role in generating pain. So now imagine this is a muscle. There is a muscle fiber here. There is another broken muscle fiber here. This is my diagrams of the muscle. And then this is one nerve with the free nerve endings. This is another nerve with the, one of the free nerve endings over here. What did I want to show over here on the free nerve ending? First important thing to note is that there is a receptor sodium channel. And I would, I think I have explained last time, but it is important to realize that the cells on the inside are negative because of the proteins present inside. And so the positives are sitting outside and that creates the polarity. And when we want the cell to function, we will like it to depolarize. That means the, the charge inside and the charge outside to become equal. When the cell becomes depolarized in these kind of cells, for example, nerve cell, muscle cell, endocrine gland cell, many, many uh, other type of cells have this function. When they become depolarized, when they lose the charge across their membrane, they, that, they take that as a signal to do something. So this is why it is called action potential. This is the zero potential is for them to act. So here, if a muscle is injured, that muscle will release ATP. And I had this discussion last time as well that everything, every cell of ours has ATP as currency of function in it. When a cell is crushed or injured, or for example, it has less nutrition or it has less oxygen, it will become a little more permeable or it just when it is crushed, it would just break down. The result is that the intracellular contents will spill out 
in them, of course, adenosine triphosphate will spill out as well. So our body, in its wisdom, has decided that whenever I see ATP roaming around in the streets, that is outside of the cells, that means some cell was broken. So body has gotten receptors on the free nerve endings that can sense the ATP's molecule and open up sodium channels and work with that. So this receptor, this channel, sodium channel, is called P2X3. So P2X3 receptor, or the sodium channel, is present on the free nerve ending for ATP. Similarly, if you see here, let me see if I can zoom it in. If you see here, this is another free nerve ending. This is the nerve here. And this free nerve ending has TRPV1 channel. This would sense hydrogen ion. So these are acid sensing ionic channels. Acid sensing. So what is the acid over here? That is protons or hydrogen. And why do we have that in the muscles? Remember when muscles work, they do produce lactic acid. And this is what happens when you are exercising or and the muscles start aching and paining and fatiguing. What's happening is that acidity is increasing in them. Most of the time that acidity is temporary. As you stop exercising, the acids are washed away and the system goes back to normal state. However, as you would see in the chronic muscle pains and in MECFS like pains, this acidic environment starts and triggers a set of activities that become a vicious cycle and the muscle stays trapped in pain and it would actually need intervention to come out of it. So here, the acid sensing ionic channels, there are two that we should remember. One is TRPV1 and the other one is ASIC, just simply gen general acid sensing ionic channel. The TRPV1 is transient receptor potential venylide 1. So these are the receptors that are present in the free nerve endings on the muscle. Actually, they are present in other areas too, but ATP and hydrogen are the most, most important chemicals within the muscle to cause pain. Now the question becomes, how do these things cause pain? So first of all, ATP. There were studies in mice where they'll take ATP and they will inject ATP in them and they would see that the nociceptors, the receptors that are connected to the pain nerves or the areas of the brain that sense pain, when you give ATP, these nociceptors become excited. They start functioning. That means they start producing or bringing the sense of well, the signal to the brain's area which would perceive pain. Similarly, whenever there is weak acidic solution that is given to our muscles from outside, it will cause pain. And we can actually produce that by simply doing exercises and producing acid in there. We can also do that by having mitochondrial damage and the mitochondrial damage would cause reduction in the um, production of ATP, which will then cause anaerobic respiration, which will produce more lactic acid, and that would cause acidosis. Plus, remember this also that mitochondrial dysfunction will produce reactive oxygen species. Those reactive oxygen species can actually harm the channels on the cell membrane of the muscle cell, which are responsible, the channels that are responsible for correcting the ionic states. So whenever we have inflammation, we have a lot of risk for the muscular pains to occur and then to become chronic. So here, once again, this is the P2X3 ATP channel. This is a sodium channel. When ATP connects here, the sodium will start going in, and this is the receptor area. Now, please remember that this is the free nerve ending, this is the receptor area, and then this is the nerve. It is going towards the central nervous system, central nervous system being the spinal cord and the brain, uh, nerve, uh, 
the brain tissue yes now i want to tell an important thing over here to keep in mind the receptor areas especially for the pain receptors i'm sure it is true for others too the receptor areas do not have voltage gated sodium channels and we'll discuss that next time when we'll talk about polarization and depolarization i have discussed them with dr bean as well so one can watch there the voltage gated sodium channels are not present in the receptors that means a receptor cannot produce action potential so those of us <laughs> who have been to medical schools or uh, who are studying now they are aware of action potentials that the fast sodium channels open up and the sodium goes in that causes the depolarization of the area and that is an action potential because receptor areas do not have sodium voltage gated sodium channel they never develop action potential in them so then the question will become and my apologies for non medical folks that uh, this is a slightly technical discussion but important discussion and that is what is the benefit of a receptor if it doesn't have voltage gated sodium channels to produce action potentials so here is a very important thing to keep in mind imagine that this is the receptor free nerve ending and let's just take one sodium channel on it this is not a voltage gated sodium channel this is an atp gated sodium channel so when some muscle other muscle cell became broken oh, sorry this is a nerve so some muscle cell became broken some tissue cell became broken atp became produced or spilled out that atp is now bound to this sodium channel's receptor p2x3 and sodium is going into the nerve receptor free nerve ending this sodium will get in and start accumulating in here imagine this is like a bag in which you start stuffing so sodium ions what is the benefit of doing that these sodium ions that you have collected here I said this last time when I was doing this Zoom call, that if I had a an audio setup there, I would play a sound of a gas filling up. So imagine that sound is occurring and sodium is coming in, and this, this receptor area is filling up the sodium. When it filled up sodium, that sodium from here will slowly trickle in to this, which is connected to the receptor. So when the sodium will come into the nerve area, that is where the sodium gated channels are present and action potential would occur. However, so imagine this is the sodium gated channel. This is sodium voltage gated channel that is present over here. Now some to the nerve that causes the nerve to produce the action potential then some more leaks in and more action potential some more leaks in some more action potential so what is happening is that the receptor has stored sodiums to continue to produce or to continue to help the nerve produce action potentials that means when the crushing injury occurs or when the stress occurs to the muscle cell or any cell nearby this nerve ending the nerve ending will become filled and will continue to send impulses for a long time this is why even for example if there is a tissue injury or if there is a temporary stimulus that can cause pain even when the stimulus has gone back the pain might be felt for a longer time it can be because of injury and it is also a little more durable because of the sodium that has filled up in the receptors now with that quick very important thought please don't forget this one now other channels over here so this is another sodium channel this is hydrogen sensing channel so acid sensing ionic channel whenever we have acidity the free nerve endings in the muscle convert that into pain why think about it for a second normally 
whenever any muscle cell or any cell functions, normally what happens is you take glucose or the nutrients, you take oxygen, and then you bring them into Krebs cycle, and finally you make a bunch of ATPs inside the mitochondria. You can make those ATPs without the help of mitochondria in the cytosol, but the amount of ATP produced is less. Net two ATP molecules are made in the cytosol compared to about 32 additional ATPs made if the mitochondria is working. So when the mitochondria is working, we are generating a lot of ATPs and everything is good. Less acid is produced because only two ATP molecules are produced by the anaerobic respiration and less lactic acid is produced. If somehow the mitochondria is not working correctly or if the nutrients or sorry, the oxygen is not present correctly or in the correct amounts, then mitochondria are not functioning as well as they should. The result is that the cell is going to say to its cytosol, to its outside the mitochondria area here, to say, I need to make ATP here. Now, for every glucose molecule, only two net ATPs will be formed, while lactic acid will be formed as well. So to make, a, let's say, 100 molecules of ATP, you're going to have so many glucoses come in, and they will make more acid as well. So this is actually an indication of a problem in the cell. And that is why our body has made sure that whenever hydrogen ions are more, or whenever pH goes down, we sense that as pain so that we can correct it. There is another reason for us to react this way to pH or, or acidity, and that is the acids or the protons, hydrogen ions, they can actually cause denaturing of the proteins and damage them. So body is very sensitive to this. So anytime there is hydrogen increase or pH reduced, body is going to sense that through these pain nociceptors and create the perception of pain. Then there is another chemical substance called nerve growth factor or NGF. It is released when there is inflammation present in the muscle areas. Nerve growth factor, when it is produced in, from the inflamed muscles, it also has its sodium channels on the nociceptors or on the receptors for pain. So remember, where they go and connect it is a sensory area in the brain that perceives the pain as pain. And I had done that talk last time. So when I say nociceptor for pain, it's really, or when I say receptors for pain, they're connected there. Receptor is just a receptor. So anyways, the NGF also has a sodium channel based system attached to the nociceptors. So whenever there is nerve growth factor in the environment, that would also open the sodium channel and so and fill this bag which will then cause sodium to go into the nerve and that would open up the sodium channels and impulses would start occurring and now the patient is feeling pain. Then more recently another set of receptors, nociceptors have been found and I believe this was uh, uh, Nobel Prize was given to the uh, founders of this channel as well. So these are piezo 2 channels. These are mechanical channels connected with the nociceptors and they help excite these receptors. And they are usually present in the bone marrow and also present in the um, central nervous system. However, they're also present in the muscle and bone areas too. Propri they also help with the proprioception. Proprioception is the sense of position of the body. So proprioception is not nociception. Proprioception is just knowing where your body parts are. If I ask you to close your eyes and touch your nose with your finger, you can do that. And that is because you know where your body parts are. That is proprioception. Proprioception also needs piezo 2, but piezo 2 are also present on nociceptors too, so they can actually help build or contribute to pain feeling. 
Now, check this out. This is very interesting. When a receptor for pain or nociceptor becomes excited, uh, look, I'm not saying has an action potential because it doesn't have the sodium channels voltage gated to produce an action potential. So when sodium goes in here, when the positivity goes in here, we'll just simply say it is excited. When it is excited, it starts releasing substance P and CGRP or the calcitonin gene related peptides. These two substances are actually pro-inflammatory substance. It is re being released from the nociceptor, the receptor area itself. And so when the substance P is released and CGRP is released, what they do is they act on the local blood vessels of the muscle and they cause the blood vessel to dilate and they cause the permeability of the blood vessel to increase. The permeability of the blood vessel can increase in many, many ways. More common ways that I can mention is, for example, the blood vessel endothelial cells. They will contract and create gaps between them through which the uh, substances can pass more easily. There are other ways as well that they can be moved away from each other. So the, the permeability is increased, blood vessel is dilated, more blood is in this area. So now there will be swelling, now there will be redness. Plus, because the permeability has increased, the blood vessel has become more permeable. The, the fluids are going to start seeping out and local area will become swollen with fluids or edema would occur. So I hope my <laughs> audio and video so far is fine because I'm running on this uh, iPad. Uh, I just saw Zygmunt's inter interruptions here to sounds goes tiny. Do you feel that it is not good enough quality that I should just stop and do it when the <laughs> Who is this? Says sounds like the discovery found with the great Manita Muscaria mushrooms. <laughs> okay, so uh, how about the audio? Is audio okay? Okay. Okay, so we'll continue if the if it becomes bad enough, just put a comment and I'll read the comments and we'll redo it. However, I'm on a roll. I want to talk about this one. So what happens is I was going to talk about the which area? Edema. Yes. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second to explain a mechanism. Imagine someone has a nerve compression. Very often in the back pain kind of situations, there is nerve compression that can happen. Cervical areas can have nerve compressions as well. When nerve compression occurs, the area where the nerve is connected can start becoming inflamed. It can start becoming swollen. So let me now draw this and explain. This is such an interesting um, mechanism but that mechanism is uh, related to this this to this little mechanism that I explained so let's do this over here imagine that this is a spinal cord and some nerve that is coming out of it and entering it so dorsal root and ventral root, let's just call it spinal nerve over here. Let's say this is a spinal nerve. Somewhere over here, there is compression here, here. Somewhere there is compression of the nerve. When the nerve is compressed, of course, what will happen is if I make this nerve a little bigger over here, let's say I make it look like a little pipe so I can work on it. So imagine that this is, this is the area that is under compression. What happens is that when that compression occurs, the channels open up over here. This is in the middle of the nerve or really near the spinal cords, you know, exit. 
the compression occurs, the sodium channels start opening up. So guess what will the, these channels do? These sodium channels would cause pain signal to travel towards the spinal cord and then relay here, then go to the opposite side and go to the brain. We did this discussion last time. The only thing is now there is no receptor. Instead, there is the area of the nerve that is under stress and is producing signal from here. While the actual receptor for the nerve is somewhere over here. This is the actual receptor, the, the transducer is here, nociceptor is here. Good. So the pain should just start from here and go to the brain. But that doesn't happen. What happens is when the signal starts here, it doesn't just go towards the center, center being spinal cord and the brain. It actually travels towards the periphery as well, where it should not have been going. Normally, the signal would come from here all the way to the spinal cord and the brain. But it is going this way as well. This will be called centrifugal pathway. And this travel is called centripetal pathway pathway going towards the center. This is going away from the center, centrifugal pathway. This centrifugal pathway becomes active. So you could say, so what? Fine. It, the nerve traveled this, the signal traveled this way too. So what? Well, here is what happens. When the signal reaches the area of the nociceptor, guess what nociceptor will do? Guess what we just saw over here? The nociceptor releases substance P and CGRP. So when the nociceptor would re release substance P and CGRP, so tell me this, was there a problem here? Imagine that this is the nerve connected to our calf or our foot. Was there a problem here? No, the problem was near the spinal cord of this nerve that is coming from the foot and going towards the spinal cord, somewhere near the entry of the spinal cord, it is compressed, correct? So this signal makes sense. This release will do what? It is inflammatory substance. It would cause the local blood vessel to become swollen up or not swollen up, dilated and become more permeable, causing more fluids to ooze out and edema to develop here and inflammation or redness and pain and edema developing there. So now we have a compression of the nerve somewhere in the spinal column and we have inflammation or swelling of the feet or the leg or some other tissue. And now you're looking at that and saying, what the heck is going on with this tissue? What happened to my foot? What happened to my calf? What happened to my thigh? Isn't that interesting? And this not only is this much interesting, this is also possible that when the centrifugal impulse comes here and fills the nociceptor with sodium, then this sodium will leak back, creating action potential which will once again go this way. And because it is going to meet this area of excitation, it would then come back this way. And now we have a, we have a problem, right? So we will discuss this more in the chronicity of the pain that when does the pain become chronic? What are the mechanisms? But this is important to keep in mind that it is possible that the compression of the nerve in one area will cause the swelling in another area because of this mechanism. Okay, going back here. So here now, this is what happens. Now continuing. Some more now discussion. So we talked about mechanical uh, issues, the crushing injury issue, releasing hydro uh, ATP, then uh, Nutritional issues where blood vessels are constricted and there is less oxygen coming in, causing acidosis. Now we're talking about the muscle lesion itself, muscle injury itself. There is, imagine, some injury to the muscle. When the any cell is injured, including muscle, then we start having bradykinin because of the calicrin, which is a an enzyme that will work within the cytosol of the cell and that would help produce bradykinin. Then we have cyclooxygenases that would help produce prostaglandins. 
these will of course be released from the damaged tissue. When these are released, they would also work on the receptor and they also excite the receptor. Exciting would mean that you would put more sodiums in there. They would also sensitize it. So what is happening? There is some injury to the muscle that has caused inflammatory molecules to be released. Those molecules have caused the local nerves to become sensitive. And now allodynia would occur and hyperalgesia would occur. So I'm sure that the uh, healthcare professionals that are sitting here would say, oh, Mubin is totally wrong here. Allodynia and hyperalgesia are the concepts or the mechanisms that happen in the central nervous system. That means spinal cord in the brain, the, the, you are correct. But I'm also correct that allodynia and hyperalgesia can occur in the peripheral areas as well. And I'll give you an example. Imagine somebody has first degree burn. If you touch that area of burn, that touch which will not be felt as pain anywhere else in the body will be felt as pain in that area of the first degree burn. That is the example of allodynia. Allodynia means feeling pain for a stimulus that normally does not cause pain. And hyperalgesia means that when there is a painful stimulus, the amount of pain felt or perceived is more than what it should be. Hyperalgesia. So this is correct that spinal cord changes or structural changes and the receptor density changes and the brain facilitations in the brain will participate in allodynia or will help contribute allodynia and hyperalgesia. However, this can happen in the peripheral system as well. So here, when inflammatory mediators are released from an injured tissue, they would cause sensitization of the local nerve endings producing allodynia and hyperalgesia. What does that mean? What happens is now this nerve is a little more sensitive. It has some more sodiums. It is easy to have a little more sodium to come in and that would start producing action potentials here. So these guys, bradykinin and prostaglandins, what they have done is they have filled this thing with a tiny bit of sodium. Now this thing is excited. If you add a little more sodium here, that is going to be sufficient to start producing action potential here. So inflammatory mediators will create sensitization in muscles, leading to muscle pains, which normally would not have occurred with the stimulus that is now causing pain or perceiving more pain. So this is also very important. So now what do we know so far? We know that ATP will cause pain, acidosis will cause pain, inflammatory mediators present because of the crushed tissue will cause pain. And not only just that, if the transducer, the receptor itself releases substance P and CGRP, that would cause local inflammation and edema. And then that would create a vicious cycle of creating pain as well. OK, so some more points, and then we stop. Clinical significance of this. Acidic tissue, so I have directly taken that text from there. Acidic tissue, pH are one of the main activating factors leading to muscle pain. Practically all, please pay attention to this one. Practically all pathological and pathophysiological changes of skeletal muscle are accompanied by a drop in pH among them. So can you think about this, that why would every pathology of the muscle is accompanied by a drop in pH, is accompanied by acidosis? Almost every injury to the muscle or every stress to the muscle. Imagine I'm sitting right now over here and I'm leaning and I'm excited and I'm talking and my muscles of my legs are all compressed and they're, they're pressed against the, against the chair. What is happening there? Amount of blood coming in is less. 
of course, oxygen will be less. Of course, the, those muscles are now working in ischemic state, although temporarily I'll get up and walk and it'll be fine, hopefully, but they're working under ischemic state now. What are they going to produce? Anaerobic respiration. What would that do? Produ production of acidosis. Imagine you are sitting and listening to me and you're sitting and you're attentive and your back is stretched and the muscles are stretched. A stretched muscle would have less supply in it because it is stretched. And so it is thinned out and the blood supply to it is a little difficult because the resistance of the muscle has increased. What will happen? Oxygen is less now. That would cause ischemia, that would cause acidosis. Then there are central conditions as well. Sometimes people have strokes or the brain tissue injury, which in turn causes disinhibition of the spinal cord, which in turn causes the muscle to become, you know, extra excited and the tone increases in them. And now they have a problem with the blood supply as well. So there are then sp spasticity is a different total different discussion to have. But almost every time muscle is involved, and not just with mechanical, as I gave you the example, even chemical, for example, whenever there is inflammation and inflammatory mediators present near the muscle, what is what are you seeing? Abnormality in hemodynamics plus problems with the ionic system, most importantly, hydrogen ion. We just saw what would happen is that once the excitation is increased, that would load the system with sodium inside the muscles. I don't want to go in here. But anyways, um, basically what would happen is that inflammatory mediators would also cause acidosis or contribute towards less oxygen utilization, more reactive oxygen species, less mitochondrial function, resulting in more acidosis. So here he's saying, the researcher, Practically all pathological and pathophysiological changes of skeletal muscles are accompanied by a drop in pH, among them chronic ischemic state. If you ask me to keep sitting on my legs and glutes, they will go in a chronic ischemic state. But more important examples are heart, for example. Tonic contractions or spasms. So if I keep my muscles like this, I'm going to start feeling pain because they're tonically contracted. Or if I keep it like this, I'm going to start feeling pain because they're tonically relaxed or uh, extended. So tonic contractions or spasms, myofascial trigger points. Myofascial trigger points are the muscle knots. Just very quickly what these are. I'm going to be discussing them one by one. But just very quickly, what is a muscle knot? What happens is imagine this is a muscle. And it has many, 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 many muscle fibers in it, correct? And it also has motor nerves. Motor nerves are the nerves that are asking these muscles to work. If there is an injury somewhere in the on the muscle, what that causes is that irritates this motor nerve. I'm not talking about the sensory or pain nerve anymore. I'm talking about the motor nerve, the nerve that is making the muscles move. When that nerve is irritated, it would start releasing acetylcholine in that area, which would cause a little bunch of muscle fibers to contract. Motor nerves, they release acetylcholine from them on the muscle to cause the muscle fiber to contract. So when there is an injury, which involves the motor nerve, that motor nerve is going to start releasing a lot of acetylcholine in the local area, which would cause a little bunch of muscle fibers to become contracted under that acetylcholine that is released. That will become a knot. Now, when we have a knot, we have a problem. That bunch of little muscle fibers that have become contracted, they are pressing hard on the blood vessel that is supplying them. I want to give you an example. Close your hand, close your fist tightly and then hold it like this and then open it and see the color of it and then leave it and you'll see blood rushing in your hand. Now imagine this fist is nothing but a tiny muscle knot that is tightly closed. The blood supply to this area is reduced and this area is now getting in trouble because less blood supply would mean even more acidosis, which would then mean even more painful stimuli and more knotting. So we'll talk a, a little more detail later on, but it is important. So that is called myofascial trigger point. 
then occupationally induced postural abnormalities. If I always, I can actually assure you that I've been sitting here for three years doing these free lectures for three years, correct? I have so much wasting of my calf muscles. Sorry, not calf muscle, my thigh muscles, posterior part of thigh muscles, because I am sitting here for 10, 12 hours. So that is a that is an occupational hazard that I have. So occupationally induced postural abnormalities. Similarly, someone who is a truck driver, they have an occupationally induced uh, hazard for their muscles. Somebody who carries boxes. And so every occupation may have some stresses on the muscles and that can cause spasm of the muscles that can cause an acidosis and then damage to those muscles or pain at least in them. And then myositis. So we'll talk more about these as well. Finally, this is the mechanism I just explained. That is nerve compression to neuropathic pain. This is what I said that if the nerve is compressed, so neuropeptides stored in muscle nociceptors are released not only when peripheral stimulus activates the nerve endings. So imagine my biceps. He's saying that the, the nociceptor neurotransmitters are not only released when I crush this muscle or give a reason here, but when spinal nerves are compressed, when the nerve to the biceps is compressed here, that can cause the biceps to feel pain, not only as a referred pain, but also as the mechanism I explained that the nerves, free nerve ending will receive the signal and re release substance P and the CGRP, which would cause local edema and inflammation and pain. So in this type of neuropathic pain, action potentials are generated at the site of compression and spread not only centripetally, centripetally towards the central nervous system, but also centrifugally, that is towards the nociceptor endings, where they induce the release of vasoactive no neuropeptides, vaso which were those substance P and CGRP. In this way, neurogenic inflammation comes about, characterized by hyperemia, Wherever you put more blood, that would become hot, hyperemia. Edema, it would swell up. And the release of inflammatory mediator, which, that would cause pain. The inflammation, the inflammatory mediators sensitize the muscle nociceptor receptor and thereby increasing neuropathic pain. So now the, the process is so strange that this is released. So the local blood vessels are now... Uh, you know, dilated and the uh, this uh, permeability has increased and the edema has occurred. Plus, these things are going to cause other cells to start releasing the inflammatory mediators, which will then act on this one. And this is going to start producing pain. So pain producing more pain, compression producing pain, which produces more pain. So that is a very interesting mechanism. So you can imagine we're just doing the, the fundamentals yet. We have, we have just scratched the surface of the muscle pain and you can imagine that how many mechanisms over here are involved. And as we talk about management, you can imagine that how many aspects of management will have to be taken care of. We have to yet talk about what would happen in the spinal cord, what, what would happen in the brain, what is the facilitation that would occur, what are the DNA changes that would occur, what are the receptor densities that would change. And then think about reversing all of that to take care of the muscle pain. And this is why I always say this. I'm going to say this again over here as well. When you are managing a patient with the inflammation, with the pains, make sure that you keep inflammation controlled. Otherwise, they tend, they are at a risk of developing chronic pains and chronic issues. Here, you, there is no damage to the nervous system, but the nervous system has become facilitated for the continuously produced signals and has adapted itself to start perceiving pain more easily. Sometimes even the original pain stimulus is gone and the muscle, the nervous system is still feeling pain. So we have to make sure that we control inflammation right from the get-go. So uh, this is the discussion for today. Have a nice weekend. Like, subscribe, and share.
There are links in the description if you would like to join me on drbean.com as well. There are hundreds of more videos there. Thank you. And we'll continue with the pain series. We would go deeper and we will understand it. We would then talk about opioids as well. Then we'll talk about naltrexone. We'll talk about other pain management solutions, including lifestyle and alternative medicines too. So thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. I'll see you next week.